hi again. Um, it's a kind of a windy and blustery spring day. I wanted to talk about um, working with a young horse uh, first few times in the bit. Uh, this is my three-year-old. Uh, she's a hackney horse mare. Critically endangered. i got to give a plug for the hackneys. Um, this is either the first or second time she's had a bit on. And um, I'm just letting her wear it for now. I use a snap rope rein simply because it's uh, handy for me. I leave a halter on underneath simply because I don't want to be leading them around on the bridle on the bit. Some people use a cavasom for that purpose and that's fine too. I just find this to be very utilitarian. I can snap my rein to the halter. Um, I don't want the halter to be tight enough so that it impedes her being able to uh, move her mouth and talk because that's an important part of the process. Hi sissy. Her name is um, Hi, oh, yeah, there we go. Thank you. Her name is Kaleidoscope, and we call her Lida Rose. Um, so when I'm starting my young horses, I definitely um, use an approach of one thing at a time. So, so far with her, I have, um, she's used to the girth. She's used to me sitting on her. She's used to the saddle and then me sitting on the saddle. We've walked around with that. Uh, I've done a little bit of uh, introducing uh, long lines to the uh, to a cavison or to a halter because um, uh, she will also be a carriage driving horse. So I'm kind of doing a dual track with her. You can hear my geese in the background. I always have something to say. Um, and I've ridden her with a rope pack more because I haven't hadn't done this work yet. Um, you can see that she's still kind of uh, wondering what the bit is about, uh, moving her mouth quite a quite a lot. Something that a lot of um, horsemen are talking about nowadays is the emotional life of horses, the emotional impact our work has with them and on their nervous system. And my particular um, focus, especially since um, putting out the book, The Gallant Mouth, that talks about the mouth and how closely it is integrated into their entire body, into their nervous system, into their emotions via the nervous system. And so I want to take the approach to the bit that I don't want it to escalate their nervous system and cause um, them to become less confident, um, worried, um, and that being uh, exhibited through busyness, you know, ex excessive busyness. I mean, there is them working on you know, what is this and uh, why is it here? What, how, do, how can I move it around in exploration? So, um, so this is something that I'll do is put the bit on without the reins to see what their response is. And then I might go ahead and work on some groundwork that they already know, like maybe moving them from touch and saying, you know, this bit is in your mouth, it's kind of strange, but we can still do the same things that we always do. I was going to not do this video today because it's very windy, so um, my indoor area is um, creaking a lot from the wind, which it does. Um, but I thought, you know, I think it's more educational if you see things how they are instead of how I would love for them to be so again i'm just choosing to move her by touch um there's been some talk about um moving horses away from you versus moving horses towards you and i spent quite a bit of time thinking about that and what i've come to realize is that it is within the horse's social language 
to have both of those things. A horse may ask another horse to move over to make room because they want to come by. Um, they may ask a horse to move over simply because they're cranky. I have two mares there with young babies. Uh, they definitely ask, <laughs> demand that horses move away from their babies. And yet also you see that horses will come to people when they have an affinity with them, will attract to other horses uh, again when there's an affinity with them. So I've come to the conclusion that when the language of uh, go away is activated or used, it is for protection or safety. Um, and it's also important that um, if a horse is going to be upset, I can ask them to move away and be upset a little farther away. I don't want to tell them go away and stay away like you are being, uh, your behavior is poor or I uh, just don't want you near me. I'm saying move away as part of our language. Um, just like we teach them, when we teach them to walk forward under saddle, we don't do that and say, but it's in opposition to asking them to move backwards. Well, when we're teaching them to move forwards, we're not thinking about moving backwards because that's another place in the language and in the communication. So when I'm asking her to move away, uh, I'm not thinking about, but what if she won't come near you know what if she won't learn or refuses to learn or have I spoiled the learning of come here and those two things are not mutually exclusive so um, but I believe and I've experienced that um, move away is a lot about safety and come back is a lot more about connection. And we want both, because if all we have is come here, then I could have a very upset horse in my lap and they're much bigger than I am and, um, and things can get dangerous in a hurry. And it's interesting to me, usually this activity of stepping back is pretty rote for her, pretty easy, no problem. And she's exhibiting some a um, little bit of resistance in it and you know how can i quantify that resistance you know i don't know is it frustration is it just being a little bit more active in her nervous system from the wind is it uh, some to do with the bit in her mouth probably a little bit of everything but um, i have set up these activities to be part of our base language and so if one of the activities isn't functioning very well, that is at the very least good information for me. I want to take the time with the bit, introducing the bit, um, just like I did with the saddle, um, the idea of a cinch, the idea of things moving around her, all of these, um, one thing at a time. And as much as is possible within my approach um, as uneventful as possible. Because like I said, I don't want this mode of communication to be spoiled in the future because the introduction was, was unpleasant, um, misunderstood, confusing, um, even painful. Uh, because in my neck of the woods, it is pretty common to put a bit on a horse and then tie that bit to the saddle, to the tail, um, under the horse's front legs. Um, and that is their attempt at education. And I've got really no comment about that, except for my goals are different. I want to have the communication, but I want to have it in, um, in that they are receiving it in relaxation, you know, uh, through their nervous system, through their emotions, through their understanding that it is so clear that it's almost kind of boring. 
Um, so before I, I talk to her about the bit in particular, I want to, to work on the activities that aren't functioning quite as well with she and I and see how that might, there we go, that might help her. Something I just occurred to me is that with an active horse like she is, she's, uh, uh, some can say it's a quality of the breed, they're active, uh, they explore a lot with their mouth. Um, this could be kind of over um, active in the mouth because they already have a lot of activity and exploration in the mouth. So it's almost like um, lighting up her mouth a little bit too much, which um, a lot of the more uh, active breeds like that, that can be more active, they're not automatically more active, like um, some people might describe them as the hotter breeds, like Hackneys or Arabs, um, some Morgans, some Saddlebreds, Thoroughbreds. Um, it might be uh, a tolerance issue that it's very difficult for them to tolerate this much activity just having a bit in their mouth. So I'm going to try here to say, can we take some of this activity down a notch and just quiet the mouth a little bit and not just um, allow this to keep spiraling. Even if it doesn't spiral upwards, if it keeps spiraling, but I'm not achieving my goal of relaxation in the mouth. 